It could be called, and it has been called, one of the greatest marketing blunders of all time. I'm talking about what happened to Coca-Cola in 1985. Now, some of us may not have been born in 1985. I was seven. In 1985, Coca-Cola was obviously one of the leading soft drinks in America. But Coca-Cola was receiving some competition, some stiff competition from Pepsi. Throughout the years, Pepsi had begun gaining some market share, and Coca-Cola began to get a little bit nervous. Pepsi had gone after the younger generation, and for those of us who remember all of this, you may remember uh, spokesmen like Michael Jackson and all of these commercials that were really geared toward the younger generation, and more and more people started drinking Pepsi. Pepsi began doing these blind taste tests, and it always came out that Pepsi tasted better than Coca-Cola. And so Coca-Cola got nervous. They were trying to figure out, look, what are we going to do? We're losing market share. We're, we're losing the younger generation. And so they decided to make a small little change. They said, we're going to change the formula of our product. We need to change the taste a little bit to make it a little bit more comparable to Pepsi. That small change would turn into a really big deal, and not for the better for Coca-Cola. They would introduce on April 23rd, 1985, what was called New Coke. And they would be sorely disappointed. Because after New Coke was released, they put aside the regular Coca-Cola for a while, and they saw that their sales began to plummet. Not only that, but people were outraged. People were upset. You can't take my Coca-Cola from me. This New Coke isn't cutting it. And so people began, got really upset. And in a span of about three months, by July 11th of the same year, they would eventually discontinue New Coke. And they would launch again Coca-Cola, and they would call it Coca-Cola Classic. And when you look this up on the internet, it's interesting because it's referred to as one of the biggest marketing blunders of all time. They had the perfect thing. They didn't need to change anything. And they would have to learn the hard way. A small change turned into something really, really big. You know, there are a lot of companies that will do things like this. They believe that, look, we got to keep staying aggressive and progressive, and we need to make sure that we're capturing that younger generation. And so they often will make small changes to their product, and sometimes it may work out for the better. But for a lot of companies, it typically does not work out that way. You think about McDonald's. McDonald's started off making hamburgers, fries, and shakes, and now you can go there and get pretty much anything you want. You can get, you can get chicken wings, maybe you can get sushi. I don't know. You can get anything you want at McDonald's today. They need to go back to the original and just stick with the formula that made them successful in the beginning. Now, I say all of this because this idea of making small changes is not just with respect to companies. Sadly, this often happens in religion. With respect to Christianity, God has given us a standard to follow, His Word. And it's not up to us to change His pattern, His Word, or his formula. But unfortunately, a lot of people will make some small changes every once in a while. And they say, well, what's the big deal? Well, ladies and gentlemen, small changes are always a big deal when we start talking about God and his word. And there is always going to be someone outraged when people begin to make changes to what we find in the word of God. And that person who will always be outraged is God. Small changes are a big deal in the eyes of God, and I will say it's much more than a blunder for man to make small changes, whether it's with, with respect to salvation or how we worship our Father in heaven. It's much more than a blunder. It's sinful in the eyes of God. Amen. And this morning, what I want to talk about for a few minutes is this idea that small changes indeed are big. Small changes are big in the eyes of the Lord. And I want to focus particularly on the concept of worship. I understand that we are to be a living sacrifice to our Father in heaven every single day. But I want to talk about the idea of worship as we come together as the people of God. When you look around just in Beaumont, Texas, in the world for that matter, there have been some, some changes that have been made to what, how people worship the Lord. And these are small changes in the eyes of men but they are big changes in the eyes of God. And we need to understand that this is always a big thing to God and that we need to ultimately stick to his pattern, stick to his formula, stick to the pattern of sound words because worship is all about pleasing to God, being pleasing to our Lord. Did you come here this morning to be pleasing to God? 
I hope you did, because worship is about being pleasing to our Heavenly Father. It's about praising and giving Him honor, glory, and praise. And so I want to look at how some people today have made some small changes with respect to what we find in the New Testament when it comes to how we worship our Father in Heaven. Now, before we go there to set all of this up, I want to look at an example in the Old Testament about a man who made some small changes to worship for the Israelites. Now, it was a small change in his eyes, but it was a really big deal in the eyes of the Lord. I want you to turn over to 1 Kings chapter 11. In 1 Kings chapter 11, we find a powerful text about the importance of following the standard, the authority of God. So many other passages that we could look at. We're going to look at one example today, and we're going to look at a man by the name of Jeroboam. Are you familiar with a man by the name of Jeroboam? If not, then you will be by the end of the sermon today. And if you are, then this will be a nice little refresher's course for you. We pick up the story of Jeroboam in 1 Kings chapter 11, and I want to begin in verse number 11 here in just a moment. If you recall, God had made Israel a mighty nation. King Saul was the first king. David was the second king. The third king was who? Oh, boy. The third king of Israel was who? Solomon. All right. All right. Got to rise the attention. The third king was Solomon. And Solomon would reign for a span of 40 years. He was the wisest king ever to live. And if Solomon would simply listen to the Lord, he would be blessed all of his days. But Solomon allowed his wives to turn his back to the Lord so that he was not fully following the Lord. And when we pick up the story in 1 Kings 11 and verse number 11, we see that God spoke to Solomon and told him what he was going to do. The Bible says, So the Lord said to Solomon, Because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. The kingdom at that time had been united in nature, but God said, because you've disobeyed me, I'm going to tear it from you, and eventually we would have what would be known as the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, in the same chapter of chapter 11, look at verse number 28. We are introduced to a man by the name of Jeroboam, and it would be Jeroboam that would eventually begin to rule over the northern kingdom, the ten tribes of Israel. Look at verse number 28. Now, the man Jeroboam was a violent warrior, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he appointed him over all the forced labor of the house of Joseph. It came about at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him on the road. Now Ahijah had clothed himself with a new cloak, and both of them were alone in the field. Then Ahijah took hold of the new cloak, which was on him, and tore it into twelve pieces. He said to Jeroboam, "'Take for yourself ten pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, "'Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand,' of Solomon and give you 10 tribes. So this prophet is telling Jeroboam what is going to happen. So Jeroboam would receive this information. He would eventually have to be on the run and he would run away to Egypt because Solomon would then come after him because of all the things that he had learned. So Jeroboam would eventually become king over the northern kingdom of the 10 tribes of Israel. But God said, listen, I'm still going to leave some for the descendants of Solomon. And so his son Rehoboam would rule over Benjamin and Judah. Now, all of this would take place after the death of Solomon. Now, look at chapter 12. In chapter 12, Solomon died in chapter 11. Chapter 12, Rehoboam now is in charge. This man, the son of Solomon, he would make some poor decisions. He would listen to the wrong people with respect how to treat and to lead the people of Israel. And as a result of that, that really initiated this division or this separation with the people of Israel. And so we pick up this story in 1 Kings chapter 12 where God had told Jeroboam already, if, if you just listen to what I want you to do, I will bless you. I'll give you, these, give you these tribes and you will live a long and prosperous life if you just listen to what I want you to do. And so all of this now has come to pass in chapter 12. And I want to pick up the story now in verse number 25 because Jeroboam now is ruling over Israel, the 10 tribes, Rehoboam is in Jerusalem, and he is ruling over Benjamin and Judah. But things would quickly change. Jeroboam had been told by God, just follow me and you'll be blessed. But Jeroboam began to think of, think of some things on his own. Look at 1 Kings 12 and verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and, bit, and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, 
Then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Jeroboam recognized the place of worship for the people was supposed to be in Jerusalem. But he began thinking about it, and self-preservation, I guess, kicked in. And he said, listen, I don't want the people to go to Jerusalem because that might take, they may take all the people away from me, and then I might eventually die. So I want you to see what Jeroboam does here. Jeroboam is going to change some things. He's going to make some small changes, at least in his eyes, and maybe even the eyes of the people. But I want you to see just how big these small changes really were. Read that verse again in verse number 27. He said, If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. And he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set one in Bethel. And the other he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places and made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month on the fifteenth day of the month, like the feast which, which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar. This would have been the feast of tabernacles. Thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. Do you see what this man did? He made some small changes that would eventually be a really big deal in the eyes of the Lord. I want you to notice just a couple of things about the law. When it came to what God wanted his people to do with respect to worshiping him, where, how, when, God gave his people detailed instructions. He gave them a pattern to follow. And he said, this is what you do. This is what's going to be pleasing to me, and this is what you need to do. When it came to who they were to worship, God said, you worship the Lord your God. We read about that in the Ten Commandments. Don't have any idols before me. You worship me, and you worship me alone. And he said, the place of worship needs to be in Jerusalem. That is where I want you to worship me. And when it comes to the priest that would make the sacrifices and work at the altar and things like that, the priest must come from the the tribe of Levi. You see the details he's given them here? And he said, with respect to the Feast of the Tabernacle, and you can read about that in Leviticus chapter 23. In fact, turn over to Leviticus chapter 23 because I want you to notice the language that the Lord used. In Leviticus chapter 23, and I want you to notice verse number 39, when it came to the Feast of the Tabernacle, this was a feast to help the people remember how the Lord had brought them out of Egypt. And I want you to notice in Leviticus 23 and verse number 29, God gave them detailed instructions. He said, on exactly the 15th day, Of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days, with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. Now go back to 1 Kings, and I want you to again notice what Jeroboam did with respect to the law. Do you see how Jeroboam changed some things? They were small, but they really were a big deal in the eyes of the Lord. Think about this. God said... You worship me and me alone. You have no idols before you. What did Jeroboam do? He made golden calves. He put one in Dan. He put one in Bethel. And maybe these calves were to uh, represent God. And he said, listen, these are the ones that brought you up out of Egypt. Isn't that an amazing thing? I was thinking about why did he do this? I think maybe for a couple of reasons. Number one, he had fled to Egypt. And so maybe he saw some of these things in Egypt. But number two... He knew the people and the history of God's people and how they could often easily be swayed with these idols. And so what Jeroboam did here, he made a small change. He said, listen, I want you to put your attention now on these golden calves. Small change, but it was a big deal in the eyes of God because it was sinful because he changed what God wanted. Think about what he did with respect to worship. He said, listen, it's too far for you to go to Jerusalem. That's going to take too long. You go to Bethel or Dan. 
I want to give you a couple options to make it easier based upon where you live. Now, if you know anything about Bethel, Bethel was a great place. You remember some of the things that happened in Bethel? In Genesis 12 and 13, Abraham built an altar at Bethel. Jacob saw the ladder descending from heaven at Bethel. Jacob, I believe, in Genesis chapter 35 would bring his family back to Bethel. Bethel was a great place. It was a place of worship. But what Jeroboam did was sinful in the eyes of God. Because God told him, my people worship in Jerusalem. He made a small change, but it was a big deal in the eyes of the Lord. And then notice this. Jeroboam said, listen, I'm not going to worry about getting men from the tribe of Levi. There's a lot of other great men out there. They can serve as priests. Let's get everybody just to kind of help out. That sounds pretty good. Good intentions. But it was not according to the pattern that God had given his people. And then the last one. Go back to the text and notice again in 1 Kings chapter 12, in verse number 32, Jeroboam instituted a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar, thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he had his own men, and now he had his new location. And he said, we're just going to change this a little bit. Still going to keep it on the same day, the 15th day. We're just going to push it to the eighth month. Surely that's not a big deal, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, you better believe it was a big deal. Because twice in that text... It says that the things that Jeroboam did, it was sinful in the eyes of God. Verse 33, Jeroboam, he had devised in his own heart. He was not following God's pattern. He had devised in his own heart what he was going to do. Now turn over to 1 Kings 13, and I want you to notice at the end of the chapter, in verse number 33 and 34. 1 Kings 13, verses 33 and 34, God gave warnings to Jeroboam but he would continue to do evil in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says after this event, Jeroboam did not return from his evil way, but again he made priests of the high places from among all the people. Any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. Hey, you want to be a priest? You come right ahead. Don't worry about what the law says. Don't worry about what Leviticus says. That the priests have to come from the tribe of Levi. Everybody can do this job. It's not a big deal. Look at verse 34. This event became sin to the house of Jeroboam, even to blot it out and destroy it from off the face of the earth. You read Jeroboam, you're reminded all the time in the Old Testament about how he made these small changes and how these small changes were indeed, my friends, way bigger than just something or way, way more than just a small change. They were, they were a big deal in the eyes of the Lord. Now, if we can understand that in the Old Testament, where God gave his people a pattern to follow, gave them explicit details. This is what I want you to do. This is when I want you to do it. This is how I want you to do it. Don't you think God is going to do the same for his people today? Indeed, he has. But sadly, there are a lot of people, even though they have good intentions, that have made some small changes to how God wants us to worship that are a big deal in his sight. I want you to turn over to the New Testament, and I want to share with you just a couple of things here. Like Jeroboam, many religious people have made small changes to God's pattern of worship. And what they fail to understand is that what they have done is a big deal. Looking at primitive Christianity, go back in the New Testament, begin in the book of Acts, and you look in the book of Acts, and you can see a pattern of worship for the people of God. You look throughout the New Testament, and we can see that there was indeed a pattern that God's people followed, and God expects us in 2016 to follow the same pattern. The pattern is not outdated. The pattern is not boring. The pattern is not lame. It is from God, therefore it is perfect, and God expects us to follow it. Do you know the pattern? You need to know this pattern because there's a lot of people out there that are changing the pattern. And this is about us being pleasing to our Heavenly Father. Can I share with you a couple of things with the New Testament worship and the pattern that we follow? First of all, we find that the saints in the first century, they assembled together. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 18, the saints, Paul said, he said, when you gather together as a church, when you come together as a church. So we know, first of all, that Christians were gathering together as a collectivity. When people start to say, well, I'll have Jesus, but I don't want the church, and I didn't sign up for worship and coming to services every Sunday, my friends, they're mistaking something about Jesus. 
Because the saints in the first century, they gathered together. That's why in Hebrews 10.25, the Hebrew writer reminded them not to forsake the assembly. So we know, number one, that they gathered together, and we know when they gathered together. Look at Acts 20 and verse number 7. In Acts 20 and verse number 7, we know that they gathered together on the first day of the week. The Holy Spirit gives us a time reference here. The time reference is critical. The time reference is important. That's why the Holy Spirit gave it to us. And in Acts 20 and verse 7, the Bible says, On the first day of the week, when they were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, and he prolonged his message unto midnight. So we learn a couple of things. Number one, the saints gathered together. Number two, they assembled on the first day of the week, which would be Sunday. And we learn from that text that they would partake of the Lord's Supper just as we did the communion, the Lord's Supper, every first day of the week. Upon the first day of the week when they came together, the disciples broke bread. This was a part of the pattern. We know that they were taking the Lord's Supper, and now we are given the time with respect to how often they were partaking the Lord's Supper. Not only that, but from Acts 20 and verse 7, we know that they were teaching and preaching from the Word of God. Paul was going to preach, and that is indeed what he did. In Acts 2 and verse number 42, turn over there. We know that the word of God was important to them, that they strive to follow in the apostles' doctrine. In Acts 2 and verse number 42, the Bible says they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. The word of God was important to them. In Acts 11 and verse 26, Barnabas and Paul spent about a year in Antioch teaching the Christians teaching from the Word of God, because the Word of God has always been important to God's people, or for God's people. So we know that they were gathering often. They gathered on the first day of the week. They took the Lord's Supper weekly. They taught and preached from God's Word. We know that they prayed. Acts 2.42 helps us to see that. They were devoted to prayer, not just in their individual lives, but also as a collectivity. And they sang praises to God. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, the only music we find in the New Testament are the saints singing praises to God? Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, Hebrews 13, 15, praising God with the fruit of the lips. They sang and they prayed to their heavenly Father as they came together and worshiped the Lord. And notice something else that they did. They gave financially for the work of the church and for benevolence. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, a popular passage, but good for us to read again. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I want you to notice a couple of verses here. We know that this was a part of the pattern in the first century. Paul said, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. This collection was for a particular group of people. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. Folks, we can find a pattern in the first century with respect to what the Christians did as they worshiped their Heavenly Father. But a lot of people today, and while they have a lot of good intentions, and listen, this is a warning for us. While people can have good intentions, our responsibility is not to try to change worship, not to try to improve it or try to devise something in our own hearts. Our responsibility is to follow the pattern of sound words. And what happens today is that a lot of people have the mentality of Jeroboam, where they say, listen, I'll make it a little bit easier for the people. Let me show you some things that people have done, what many people have done with respect to worship today. Many people now say, well, let's just assemble on Saturday. It's more convenient. Sunday, you can just relax. No more Bible class at 930. You can sleep in, and you can catch the entire game. We assemble on Saturday. It's, it's a little bit more convenient maybe for people out in the world. The pattern we find is that the first day of the week held great significance for the, for the people of God. Jesus was raised on the first day of the week. The church was established on the first day of the week. The disciples came together on the first day of the week. And yet, a lot of people say, well, listen, gathering on Saturday, that's just a small thing. That's not a big deal, right? Small changes are always a big deal in the eyes of the Lord. People change the day of worship to Saturday. And they change the time. With respect to when we take the Lord's Supper, many people today are taking the Lord's Supper on Saturday, and often today what we find is that people say, well, we're just going to take it monthly because we don't want to make this, we don't want to do it so much that it kind of loses its importance. Small change. What's the difference between every first day of the week, 52 times a year, to 12 times a year? We're still remembering our Savior Jesus. Is that a big deal? 
According to God, it is a big deal because he's given us a pattern to follow. You see, Jeroboam, that was his thinking. That's not a big deal from the seventh month to the eighth month, but when God gives us a pattern, he expects us to follow it. Small changes are always a big deal in the eyes of the Lord. Now, there are people who still teach and preach God's word. You're, you can go to a lot of churches, and you're going to hear the Bible being taught, you're going to hear people preaching, but a lot of people today say, well, you know, teaching the word of God, that's not enough. It's 2016. The Bible is old, it's outdated, and we don't want to feel, make people feel uncomfortable. We need to spice up worship a little bit. And so what a lot of people have today, they have praise teams, dances, skits, tes testimonies. Where do we find those in the New Testament? The answer is we don't. But it's a small change, right? It's not a big deal. Small changes have always been a big deal in the eyes of the Lord. See, there's a pattern for us to follow. And people say, listen, we're going to pray, and people do pray. We're going to sing, people do sing. But we're also going to have our bands. Because we want to get down and worship, all right? And we want to feel the Holy Spirit in worship. We need our band. It's not just on Sundays, it's actually even on Wednesdays in Bible class. I talked to a young man a couple of weeks ago, and he visited a church here in Beaumont. It was a Wednesday night, and they had all the young people come up to the front, and everybody's holding their hands up high and praising the Lord, and there's a big band, and then they start knocking people over. The young boy didn't laugh. The young boy was scared because he didn't know what was happening. He said, wait a second, I thought I was going to learn about the Bible. And so there's so many things that are out there that are confusing people. And I will tell you, my friends, rock bands, pianos, whatever the instrument may be, that's not part of the pattern. What we find is a pattern in the first century that we need to follow. And when we start making small changes, we better believe that these small changes are really a big deal in the eyes of God. What is interesting, though, is that people today will not typically take the Lord's Supper every week. But when it comes to the Benjamins, yeah, we're going to do that every first day of the week, right? We're going to pass around the plate a couple of times. If we hear any change in there, we're definitely going to pass it around again. Where do people get that from? There's clearly a pattern in the Bible. But what a lot of churches are doing today, they'll give, and they'll give of their means, but they use the funds for anything. And ladies and gentlemen, how we go about using our funds, it does matter. You see, there's a pattern with what God has given us or God has given us to follow. And so what has happened today is that a lot of people have begun to think like Jeroboam. A lot of people have begun to think like Jeroboam. And I will tell you what's interesting. People may get upset with that last point saying, well, what's the big deal if we use the funds any way we want to use them? Everybody has a line. And when people say things like that, they really don't believe what they're saying. Because you watch when a preacher buys a jet. People get upset, don't they? You can't use the money to buy your own personal jet. By the way, I don't have a jet, okay? I never will have a jet either, okay? But people always have a line. They understand, wait a second, you're using the money for something you shouldn't be using it for. See, everybody has a line. And the truth of the matter is, my friends, God has given us a standard that we must follow. And this idea that Jeroboam had, making these small changes... While they may sound good, while they may look good, while they may be appealing, while they be, may be more convenient, while they may gather in more people, there's someone who's always going to be outraged, and that is our Heavenly Father. Because worship is not about us. Worship is all about Him. And only God is able to make changes that He desires and commands. You remember the story when the people of God were complaining because they were thirsty in Exodus 17 and verse 6? They were complaining to Moses, and they said, look, we've got to get something to drink here. We're going to die out here. And so God told Moses, you guys remember what God told Moses in Exodus 17? With the rock, he told him to do what with it? He said, strike the rock in Exodus 17, and he struck it, and water came out. Then he fast forward in the story in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, and the people were complaining again. And God said, what do you want me to do? What did God tell Moses to do with the rock this time? He said, speak to it. Oh, what a second. He got water when he struck it the first time. Well, see, God has the right to say, here's what I want this time. Now, Moses, he struck the rock. And I think it shows the mercy of our Heavenly Father because God still allowed, still allowed the people to receive water. But Moses was punished because he did not view God as being holy. 
Worship is about serving and praising our Heavenly Father. And it is not up to us to design the pattern. It is up to us, rather, to follow the pattern that God has given us. And small changes to the pattern that God has given us will always be a big deal to our Heavenly Father. And so what this means is that we just simply need to stick to the book. We need to follow the pattern that God has given us. Ladies and gentlemen, as the people of God, let us never be deceived by the evil hearts or evil desires from the hearts of men. God has given us a pattern that we can know, that we can understand, and that we can follow. And let us never get to the point at Dallin Road that we start to say, listen, we got to get more people in here. we got to appeal to the younger generation. We're going to have to change some things here. No, we don't. We're not after the crowds. Jesus was never after the crowds. Jesus was after the committed. In John 6 and verse 66, there were many disciples that walked away from Jesus. There are going to be times where people are going to walk away from Jesus. Our responsibility is to hold fast the pattern of sound words and to worship and praise him as he desires. And let us never view God and his worship as something that is boring, lame, or outdated. I said that earlier. Do you view worship that way? Anyone asleep yet? When is this guy going to be done? Do you view worship as being boring, lame, and outdated? Sometimes I think brethren do. Rather, we need to view worship as being right. We are engaged in spirit-filled worship at this very moment, and it's because we are following the words of the Holy Spirit. Spirit-filled worship is not doing a dance in the middle of the aisle when the drums and the guitars are playing. Spirit-filled worship is about doing what God desires from the pattern that he's given us in his word. And the problem is never with the elements of worship. The problem is never going to be with these things at all. The problem is always going to be with our hearts. If our worship is now boring, lame, and outdated, it's not because of the elements that God has given us. It is because of our hearts. Now, don't get me wrong. We strive for excellence. We need to strive for excellence in everything that we do. Even with the preaching, we need to strive for excellence. Sermons should be clear, and the sermons, people should be able to follow along in everything we do. We should strive for excellence. But ladies and gentlemen, all of us bear a responsibility of making sure that our worship is where it needs to be. And our worship service will never become boring, lame, or outdated. And if you are feeling that way, it's not because of God, it's not because of Jesus, it's not because of the Holy Spirit, it's because of your heart. Now, there's some simple things that all of us can do to make sure that we elevate our worship. Let me give you a couple of take-home points, and then I'll wrap this thing up. All of us play a role when it comes to improving our worship. You want to improve your worship? It's already, God has already given us what we need. Now, if we want to improve our worship, there's some simple things that we can do. Number one, we can do this. You want to improve worship for yourself? Go to bed earlier on Saturday nights. I'm serious. It is hard to worship God when you are asleep in worship. You can't do it. I remember when I was young, I used to go to the movies with my sister Tanya, and we'd see the midnight show. And so we're not getting home till like 3 in the morning. And I'm sitting on the pew like this, you know, just praying that the preacher would just please hurry up. There's one time in Rockford, I would got back to services. It was evening night services, and I had my head down on the pew. And I slept through like the entire sermon. So I felt guilty. And so I went up to the preacher at the door at the end of services. I said, I really apologize for sleeping through your sermon. He said, oh, I thought you were just praying. And I said, why did I say anything? A scot-free. Now, some of you guys may be meditating, okay? When your heads are down, you may be meditating, or maybe some medication. But let's make sure we're not meditating for a full 35 or 40 minutes, and that meditation turns into sleep. Guys, go to bed earlier on Saturday nights. That's how we can improve our worship. Number two, have everything prepared Saturday night for Sunday morning. Am I the only one that feels rushed Sunday morning? You're running around. You know we got to be here at 930, but Sunday morning is like, what just happened? It's Sunday morning. Have some things prepared. Husbands, help your wives out with the children. Meditate, number three, on God and his word prior to arriving at the building. I will tell you guys, playing video games five minutes before worship begins is probably not going to get your mindset where it needs to be. Can you hold off from the video games for just 30 to 60 minutes? So instead of thinking about, oh, I could have made it to that next level, you can be thinking about, the God who created the heavens and the earth. Meditate on God and his word prior to arriving at the building. Arrive on time so you can get your mind in the proper place. There are so many great things that happen here at the Down Road Church, but we have a serious problem. 
about arriving on time and about coming back. We have a problem. I think about the seven churches to Asia, in Asia when Jesus wrote to them. Ever thought about if Jesus wrote a letter to us? To the church in Beaumont Minor. I know your good works. I know you are evangelistic in nature. I know you love one another. I know you guys are giving of your means. I know you oppose false doctrine. But I have a few things against you. Consistently being late, and I understand there are certain things that happen. But when that happens repeatedly, and then not coming at all, or sometimes, that's only a symptom of the major problem. It could be that maybe some of us have the problem of apathy or indifference. Folks, God is in our presence, and we are worshiping our King. And therefore, we need to do everything possible to make our worship service as excellent and as good as it can be for our Heavenly Father. And it says something about us with how we view the importance of worship, with how we go about getting here. That's what we can do to improve our worship. We can bring a Bible and paper so that you can follow along. You can examine your heart and remember that God is in the audience. We all need to do that. We can all need to sing and make a joyful noise. All of us need to sing. We don't have a choir here. All of us need to sing and make a joyful noise. And most importantly, we need to know that what we are doing is a really big deal in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. We are worshiping our King, the one who created the heavens and the earth. So our responsibility is to stick with what he has and to make sure that we are doing everything possible to make our worship pleasing in his sight. And the things we just looked at, the things I just mentioned, we can put these into action right now. We can put them into action at 5 o'clock. We can put them into action in a couple of weeks when the Super Bowl is on and make sure that we're here at 5 o'clock because we're worshiping the King, we're worshiping our Savior. When it comes to following God's pattern, there's a lot more at stake for us than changing a formula like Coca-Cola. For Coca-Cola, it was market share and money. For us, it's about pleasing, being pleasing to God and about making sure that we are right with him. Let's make sure that we do our very best for our Father in heaven. Let's hold on to the pattern that he's given us. Maybe there's someone here this morning who's not a child of the king. Let me just say this, and then we'll sing the invitation song. There's a pattern with respect to what God wants you to do to be saved. He wants you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He wants you to turn away from your sins. And he wants you to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Nowhere in the New Testament do we ever find someone saying the sinner's prayer. I don't care what T.D. Jake says or Joe Osteen or any preacher here in Beaumont, Texas. No one ever said the Lord's Prayer to be saved. Small change, big deal. Make sure you don't lose your soul by not following the pattern that God has for you. If you need to be saved, we invite you to come forward right now as we stand and sing.